Support for Seattle Now comes from the Pacific Northwest Waterways Association with the Columbia Snake River System, providing clean energy and sustainable commerce as Washington aims for carbon neutrality by 2030. Learn more at pnwa.net slash rivervalues. Hey, it's Patricia Murphy. It's Wednesday, and this is Seattle Now. Tim Iman's $30 car tab initiative is dead for the third time. But COVID is still causing problems for transportation budgets around Seattle. And the danger of sitting close to people on a bus isn't helping. In a minute, Seattle Times reporter Heidi Groover will tell us how COVID might reshape transit in our region. But first, let's get you caught up. As the state prepares for a possible fall surge of coronavirus cases, Governor Inslee tightened rules for colleges and universities. Some are struggling with outbreaks. Colleges will now need to provide isolation and quarantine facilities for most students if they don't have a place to go, even if they're not living on campus. Students will also need to wear masks in even more situations, and the new rules limit the number of people who can sleep in a room. King County voters are still shattering records. In the first five days of voting, King County elections says 164,000 ballots were retrieved from drop boxes. That's about 10 times the previous record set during this year's primary vote. If you've already voted, give it about two days. Then you can track your ballot online to make sure your vote was counted. And if you've been throwing on a sweater instead of flipping on the heat, you may change your mind by the end of the week. The National Weather Service says freezing temperatures are headed to the region. It's the first major frost of the season. The $30 car tab initiative is out, for now at least. No matter how you feel about that personally, people who rely on public transit or are responsible for budgeting transit are relieved. But the COVID pandemic means new challenges for the region's transit system. Heidi Groover reports on transportation at the Seattle Times, and she's here to help us get our head around what's going on and what it all means. Hi, Heidi. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure. So I-976 struck down by the Washington Supreme Court. If it had gone into effect, it would have cut more than $4 billion in transit funding. So that budget gap is no longer a problem. But public transit is suffering because of the pandemic. It's not completely safe to be in a space with other people right now. So what effect has this had on ridership for King County Metro and Sound Transit? Because that affects the bottom line, too. Uh, Yes, it does. That's right. Um, And ridership is down on transit all over the state. Here in our region, um, it's down to only about one third of its pre-COVID levels on Metro, uh, down even more on Sound Transit in recent days, down 79 or 80 percent on Sound Transit. And And so ridership is down dramatically. There are also safety concerns, not just for people riding buses and trains, but also for operators, for bus drivers. Two King County Metro bus drivers have died after contracting COVID-19. And there are a lot of questions about how these agencies will protect their employees, as well as the people who need the bus or train to get around. Okay, so is that decrease something that you see across the board, or are there some places that are seeing more traffic right now? The routes throughout South Seattle and South King County have maintained closer to normal ridership than uh, routes in other parts of the county, and especially commuter routes uh, with more people working from home. And Metro and transit advocates say that this points out something obvious, which is many people rely on transit even amid a pandemic, and many of them are essential workers, maybe people who don't have cars, or people with lower incomes. Right. Right. So it's obvious that there are people who rely on public transit who don't have the option. Moving forward, do you think the COVID pandemic, though, will influence people who may have the option to not take public transit? I think that's a a major concern for the agencies and for experts who study this sort of thing. But I, I think that it is important to remember that for many people, Public transit, uh, they argue, should be a public service that we provide um, no matter whether the so-called choice riders uh, ride or not. And additionally, once traffic starts to return to its normal levels, they may find sitting in traffic uh, quite unpleasant and they may want to go back to transit. 
Sure. There are a lot of reasons to fund public transit, equity being one of them, and access to city services, of course. And people care about transit because it is about equity and access in our city, and it is a convenience, but we don't like the trade-off. People don't like the trade-off of having expensive car tabs or higher sales tax. In that way, transit becomes just another item in the budget that is open for scrutiny. And in some ways, that's a casualty of COVID, too. What does the future for transit look like here, Heidi? Well, it's it's certainly hard to say. Both of the major agencies here in Seattle, uh, King County Metro and Sound Transit, face significant revenue shortfalls uh, because of lost tax revenue due to the economic downturn and because of lost fare revenue as fewer people are riding. And both of those agencies will have to consider different projects that they will cut entirely or put off down the road several years. Um, They will have to consider future service reductions. Metro has already cut service about 15%. And a lot of those questions just aren't resolved. And of course, there are the usual debates about what in their budget is optional, what could go, whether they can cut costs and become more efficient, and and all of those usual things that come up when budgets are tight. And there's a measure related to this on the ballot, Seattle Proposition 1, which would increase the transit sales tax by 50 percent. So it would go from 0.1 percent to 0.15 percent, which doesn't seem like a lot, but would raise a lot of money. What does Prop 1 mean for transit if it passes? That measure would pay for bus routes that service Seattle. It would also pay for some special programs for West Seattle, where the closure of the West Seattle Bridge has caused a lot of detours and transportation issues. And it would also pay for passes, ORCA cards, for people with low incomes and public school students. Okay, so That will fund some of the mechanisms for transit, but how will public transit become safe and how might a bus ride look different? Yeah, these are huge questions that agencies all over the country and I I guess all over the world are really dealing with. Um, We are already seeing King County Metro, for example, installing mask dispensers on board. We're seeing them install plexiglass barriers on some buses between drivers and passengers and, you know, talking about things like airflow on buses. And I I think beyond that, it, it sort of remains to be seen what other innovations people might come up with. I wonder what you're hearing from people who do ride public transit about their comfort level and about the future. So I think that what I'm hearing from people is certainly a sort of low level concern, just like we have going to the grocery store or to any other public place about how much exposure we're facing. But I also hear people who are concerned about how much bus service, for example, might get cut, whether it will run less frequent, whether a route near their house might stop running altogether. And I think for the people who do entirely rely on it, especially to not just go to work, but to to get groceries, to do their day-to-day errands, everything like that, they are worried about how long cuts might last and how severe they might be. Right. Because of course, if public transit has to make budget cuts, routes start disappearing and people have to walk farther to get to where they need to pick up a bus to get anywhere. That's significant. That's right. And if the bus comes less frequently, it gets much harder to to rely on it. You know, if a bus comes every 10 minutes and you miss one, that's not the end of the world. You can sort of live your life in a regular way with that. But if it comes only every 20 or 30 minutes or longer, you really have to plan ahead. It really restricts your your movement to, to things that are really regimented and planned so that you don't miss a bus and end up waiting for 30 minutes. And so even frequency changes uh, can have major impacts. All right, Heidi, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Heidi Groover covers transportation for the Seattle Times. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you. Seattle Now is produced by Claire McGrain. Sophie Reed, Caroline Chamberlain Gomez, and Jason Pagano. Matt Jorgensen does our music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow.